Okay, welcome everybody to hypothesis testing. This chapter on uh, statistics has a lot of difficult concepts. One of the most difficult that I think you need help with is the whole idea of hypothesis testing. So in general there are two branches of statistics, descriptive and inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics does what the name says, describes a sample or a population. And the statistics that we use there are x bars, uh, mu's, s, and sigma. x bar is the sample mean, mu is the population mean, s is the sample standard deviation, sigma is the population standard deviation. The other branch is inferential and what we do is we make inferences about a population from a sample. So basically in inferential statistics we ask ourselves if I find some relationship in a sample will I find it in the population that the sample was taken from? Let's do an example. Uh, this was laying on my desk, so I grabbed it. Pembaker, Maine and Francis, 1997. Uh, they were looking at linguistic uh, predictors of adaptive bereavement. Uh, their sample was 30 HIV negative caregivers following their partner's death from AIDS. The independent variable was time after death, either less than one month, I think between two and three weeks or 12 months after the death of the caregiver. The dependent variable we're going to be talking about is the expression of positive emotions in the interviews. Uh, at one month the mean was uh, 2.26 on a scale from 1 to 4 and the standard deviation was 0.49. At 12 months the mean was 2.79 and the standard deviation was 0.78. So we can talk about what's happening in the sample, that is, what does that data tell us about the sample itself? So here we see a bar graph of the data, uh, one month and 12 months. Of course, I just realized that a bar graph may not be the appropriate type of graph. Uh, it may be actually be a line graph because this is a continuous variable, that is time. Uh, the height of the blue bars indicates the mean so at, and their label. So at one month it's 2.26, at 12 months it's 2.79. And I set up the scale on the y-axis so it runs from 1 to 4, which are the possible values of this dependent variable. And the red error bars that you see are the one standard deviation above and below the mean. What does one standard deviation above or below the mean mean? The mean mean? Oh, well, we have to go back to the empirical rule, which I don't know uh, you've been exposed to, but the empirical rule describes uh, the frequencies that you see in a normal distribution. Uh, this is using sigma, so they're talking about the population, uh, but given certain uh, parameters being met, you can assume the same thing about a sample. So it could be S or standard deviations. But between uh, you know, the mean and negative and positive one standard deviations, there's 68% of the distribution in that space. So most, that is you know, two-thirds of the distribution of all the people are within plus or minus one standard deviation. So, and then of course between when you go out to two uh, standard deviations it goes up to something like uh, 98 percent and three you have almost the entire distribution. So this is the normal, uh, the empirical rule for normal distributions. So what I've done is I've overlaid and stretched out uh, that uh, graph from, graphic from the empirical rule slide over the bar graph uh, just to see what I'm talking about. That is, the bo red bars, the error bars, are w plus or minus one standard deviations. So what we're saying is for one month, 68% of the subjects fall within something like 1.7 and 2.7. And for the 12 months, 
68% uh, of the uh, subjects fall between, let's see, like 2 and 3.6 uh, or something like that. So what we see is that we're laying out these distributions over the bars to illustrate the spread or the standard deviation around the means. So you may notice that there's a lot of overlap and that's true. And in fact, uh, that's one of the things I point out when I'm teaching gender. Uh, we talk about gender differences. For example, uh, women are better at reading nonverbal cues than men. Well, we're talking about means there. And of course, there's a lot of overlap. So there's a lot of men who are much better at reading nonverbal cues than some women. So that overlap really means that you know, when we talk about gender differences or when we talk about this condition did better than that condition, you have to realize there's a lot of overlap between the conditions. You may say to yourself, well, you know, if there's so much overlap, why are we doing this? Well, remember uh, from chapter one, determinism in science says that we're able to predict something at better than random probability, than random chance. And indeed, that's what's going on, even though there's a great deal of overlap and there's a lot of you know, craziness in that uh, data, we can still predict better than random chance or ran, you know, random probability. And also, that uh, ties into the effect size. That is, what we need to do is we always need to look for an effect size when we talk about means and standard deviations. Okay, so now let's talk about inference. Uh, going, you know, using our Penny Baker example. Uh, so, in inference, we're going to ask ourselves: Is what is happening in the sample likely to happen in the population it was drawn from? That is, uh, Penny Baker had a sample of 30 subjects drawn for some population. He saw a relationship in that there is more positive words expressed at 12 months uh, than one month. Is that going to happen in the population? And first off, we have to ask ourselves, which population is he talking about? Uh, he got these 30 subjects from the University of, San Francisco, University of California, San Francisco coping project. So uh, would the population be all of the subjects in the coping project? Or could we say that the population is all San Francisco residents? Or could we say that it's all Americans? Uh, this is more of a philosophical uh, question or a question about external validity, which we'll get to in a couple of chapters. So when we're talking about making inferences, we're talking about hypothesis testing. And here's the seven steps that you go through in testing hypothesis. You create a null hypothesis. You cre create an alternative hypothesis. You set your alpha level, determine sample size, collect data, conduct the hypothesis inferential test, and then evaluate the hypothesis. So first off, we need to create a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that nothing happens. So usually when we're talking about a different groups, the null hypothesis means there's no difference between the groups. So the null hypothesis would be that there's no difference between the groups in the population. So at the population level, there's no difference between the two means at the population level. The two population means are equal. Then we create an alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is our favorite hypothesis. Usually it's the research hypothesis. For example, Penny Baker's research hypothesis was that after more uh, time, people will begin to express more positive feelings about their lost loved ones. So. Uh, the alternative hypothesis is that there would be more positive emotions expressed at 12 months than one month, and that's in the population. So the population mean for 12 months would be greater than the population mean for one month. That tends to confuse students. You have to remember the null hypothesis. Null means no. Null means nothing happened. There's no difference. And the alternative is our favorite it's the A hypothesis. You think about it like a good grade, an A. You want to get an A, so the alternative hypothesis is the important hypothesis or the hypothesis that we want to get. 
uh, this is our research hypothesis because that's what we're doing research for to prove this alternative hypothesis. However, you know that you can't say prove a hypothesis or you can't say prove anything in uh, science. Next we go to set the alpha level. The alpha level is your level of acceptable error. Since we're going to be making a statement about the population from the sample, we're going to do that in a way based on probability. And so whenever we do something based on probability, we always have to accept the fact that there's a level of error that we're going to run into. And the good thing about hypothesis testing is that we get to set that level of error. And we get to set it at a level that's acceptable to us. Uh, psychological convention says that we set the alpha level to 0.05, which means that we're wrong one out of 20 times. And uh, you know that's conventional in psychology. If uh, you know, and the alpha level is usually set at 0.05. Uh, Jacob Bernoulli, by the way, 400 years or so ago, the guy who invented most of the statistics that you learn in uh, 326, by the way, uh, he said that a moral certainty was an alpha level of 0.01. Interesting trivia there. Okay, so we continue on with uh, the steps of hypothesis testing. Uh, the next step is to determine the sample size. Uh, we're going to skip that because uh, Pennebaker already did that, 30, so there's nothing we can do about that. Collect the data, Pennebaker did this, conduct the uh, appropriate statistical tests. Uh, those tests are going to be discussed in chapters six, 6, 7, and 8 in Goodwin. So uh, you know, your options will probably be a t-test or an f-test, uh, different types of f-tests, different uh, types of tests in general, whether or not they're within subjects or between subjects. All those things will be covered in 6 through 8. But appropriate for this data set was a dependent group's t-test. And we see here uh, in APA style, uh, the t-test had uh, degrees of freedom of 29 degrees of freedom. The test statistic was 4.30. And p is less than 0.01. What is P? Well, just to review, we had a P of less than 0.01, 29 degrees of freedom. The T value was 4.30. P is the probability significance value. It's the probability of a type 1 error. And here's how you go about evaluating the hypothesis. You look at that P or significance level. If P is less than your alpha level, which we usually set at 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. If P is greater than the alpha level, we say that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So uh, if uh, Pennebaker con you know, conventionally set his alpha level at 0.05 and his P value is less than 0.01, uh, what does that tell you? It tells you that he rejected his null hypothesis. The evaluation is not over. We need to go to this table. Uh, this table is very important. Uh, you know, the two columns are reality. Uh, in uh, the first column, we have that the null hypothesis is true. That is, in real life, the null hypothesis is true, which means there's no difference between the two groups. Uh, in the uh, right-hand column, it says the null hypothesis is false. This means that the null hypothesis is false. There is a difference between the two groups. Uh, the two rows are our decisions. We have two decisions. We can you know, fail to reject the null hypothesis. Uh, that is, retain it. We, don't, we never say we prove the null hypothesis. We say we fail to reject it or retain it. And if we fail to reject it, that means we're saying that there's no difference between the groups. On the bottom row, we reject the null hypothesis. That means that we don't believe the null hypothesis is correct, which means that we believe that there is a difference in the population between the two groups. So, given that, this is a contingency table. You know, you're familiar with contingency tables. The multiplication tables are a contingency table. So, in the uh, first cell, uh, where in reality the null hypothesis is true 
and our decision is to reject the null hypothesis, is, our decision is to fail to reject the null hypothesis, that's a correct rejection. We made the right decision. Nothing happened and we believe nothing happened. Uh, moving over to the right, uh, if the null hypothesis is false, but we believe that it's true, that is nothing happened, then we're committing a type 2 error, we believe a false negative has occurred. That is, we believe that nothing happened, but we're wrong. So the negative is we believe nothing happened, it's false because we're wrong in that assumption. We failed to reject the null hypothesis when we should have. And the probability of falling into that cell is uh, indicated by the Greek letter beta, and I'll come to, back to that in a minute or so. Uh, let's say that we reject the null hypothesis, and in reality the null hypothesis is true. That's a type 1 error, and that's a false positive. Since we're rejecting a null hypothesis, we believe something happened, that is, that's the positive, but we're wrong about that, that's the false. And a type 1 error is a false positive, and the probability of landing in that cell is given by alpha, and we've already set alpha at 0.05. And then finally, the last cell, when we reject the null hypothesis when it's false, that's a correct hit. We made the right decision and we're very happy. And that's called power, statistical power. Statistical power is the ability to reject a false null hypothesis. And power is uh, given by the probability 1 minus beta. And there's a little smiley face there because that's what we want to do. Uh, when you're doing research, you want to correctly reject a, null a false null hypothesis. Since in Penny Baker's example we rejected the null hypothesis, that means that we're down in the bottom row that's shaded in. Uh, we have either committed a type 1 error or we have made a correct hit. And the probability of a type 1 error is alpha, 0.05. So we may want to figure out what the probability of having a correct. Now, uh, I skipped some of those uh, steps because uh, Penny Baker already cl uh, collected the data and decided on the sample size. Now we're going to have to go back and we're going to have to, you know, learn how to uh, do those steps. Determining the sample size first, before you can determine the sample size, you have to have an estimation of the effect size. The effect size is the strength of the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable. And you could just say, for example, oh, the strength of the relationship is, you know, uh, you know, the mean of one condition minus the mean of the other condition. And that's true, but then as you go from one experiment to another, uh, you know, that size is going to change because you're using different ways of measuring your dependent variable. The good thing about effect sizes is that they're dimensionless. That is, they, uh, a, an effect size calculated appropriately, uh, you know, can be compared to another effect size from another experiment using a different scale of dependent variable. And that's because by calculating the effect size, you create a dimensionless variable. And so, if you get a 1.58, you can say that that's a huge effect size, uh, regardless of what scale that you used, 1 to 4, 1 to 10, 1 to 100, 1 to a million. In a t-test, we calculate the effect size by calculating Cohen's d. And the formula for d is the mean of one group minus the mean of the other group divided by the standard deviation. And the standard deviation, of course, that uh, basically takes into account the scale that you're using and makes it dimensionless. And there is the formula for calculating the standard deviation if you need it. So I calculated the effect size for uh, our example from Pennebaker, and it's 1.53. The standards or rubrics are that a small effect size is around 0.20, a medium effect size is around 0.50, and a large effect size is around 0.80. So in applying those rubrics to the D of 1.53, we have a huge effect size here. It's a whopper. Okay, and so now the next step in determining our sample size. Uh, we have the effect size. 
Now what we do is we grab our copy of Cohen. Uh, Cohen Jacob Cohen is a famous, was a famous uh, psychologist and uh, did a lot of work in statistics for psychologists. And here I am mugging, I don't normally smile like that, with my copy of his uh, book on power, anal power analyses for behavioral sciences. And in the book, uh, there's formulas and tables that allow you to take the information from an experiment, such as the alpha level, such as the number of groups, such as the type of statistical test, and such as the effect size, and then figure out what, for example, the, appro the uh, first off, the power will be. So here we go back to uh, this table here, we start to fill it in. Type 1 error, that's alpha, was set at 0.05 because we're good psychologists. Uh, then getting from, uh, you know, Cohen, I find out that given uh, the difference between the means, the effect sizes, everything else, gives us a beta of 0.01. And so 1 minus 0.01 is 0.99, that's our power. So in going back to the original uh, example, we have a 5% chance of committing a type 1 error, and we also have a very, very high chance, 99 out of 100, of actually correctly rejecting a false null hypothesis. So I would bet my money on the fact that uh, in Penny Baker's example, he actually rejected a false null hypothesis. And you may be saying to yourself, oh, but wait a second. Uh, 0.99 plus 0.05 is more than 100. Yeah, you're right. Those two, uh, you know, uh, percentages don't add up to one. They're different things. So, as I said, uh, statistical power one minus beta is the ability to reject a false null hypothesis. Cohen says that power should be 80 or higher, 80 percent or higher, and. So let's say that we are going back in time to when Pennebaker was just designing this experiment. Let's say that he knew that uh, his effect size was going to be 1.53. I'll get to how you can figure that out later. He wanted his power to be set at 0 0.80 uh, because that's what you want to do. And he set his alpha level at 0 0.05 because that's what you should do as a psychologist. Well then you go back to Cohen's book, look at another table and he tells us that our sample size should be 10 per group. There are two groups, so basically he says there should be 20 subjects in the experiment altogether. Uh, Cohen actually had 30, so he had 10 more subjects than he really needed to achieve a uh, power level of 0 0.80. And remember, his power level actually was 0.99. Uh, that's what happened. He had more subjects than he needed, so he had a very high power level. Okay, so to calculate a sample size analysis, you need an alpha level, a power level, and Cohen's D in this case, or an effect size. Now, the alpha level you set at 0.05. You choose where it's going to be, and convention tells you 0.05. The power level you can set it anywhere you want, but it's recommended that you set it at 0.80, 80%. So those two things are all, you, know, you can choose what you want to do with that. Finally, you need to have Cohen's D. Unless you have ESP, which we know doesn't exist, uh, then uh, you can't really guess what the, or prognosticate what the effect size will be. However, there are two ways of going about uh, getting an effect size for your sample size analysis. The first way is to just estimate or actually guesstimate. Just say, well, I expect to have a moderate effect size. Okay, so that's what? Point, I forget the rubrics, I can't see them right now, 0.50. Uh, or you could say, oh, I really am not certain about what I'm going to find, so I'm going to say I'm going to have a small effect size, so let's say 0.20. The other way, and the much better way, is to average the effect sizes from similar studies uh, together. And by similar studies, I'm talking about uh, when you're doing converging operations or programmatic research, 
you usually have several studies that have been using similar IVs and DVs. And if that's the case, then you just look at the effect sizes from those individual studies and average them together and use that for your effect size in doing your sample size calculation. There are some other effect size measures you may want to know about. For example, in analysis of variance, there is eta squared. And uh, eta squared, the rubrics for that are a small effect size is 0.01 or so, a medium is 0.06, and a large is 0.14. In correlation, uh, Pearson's R is actually the measure of effect size. It's dimensionless. And uh, Cohen says that a small one is between 0.1 and 0.23, a uh, medium is between 0.24 and 0.36, and in psychology, a large effect size is, between, is above 0.37. Now, two final topics. I didn't talk about non-significant findings, but I should, and I didn't talk about how this applies to your research proposal. Non-significant findings. So let's look at my CAFE study, which I'm analyzing right now from the fall of 2010. Uh, the independent variable, one independent variable, is transgressor intent, whether or not the transgressor, that is the harm doer, acted accidentally or acted intentionally to cause harm. The second independent variable is the order in which I made the subjects answer my three dependent variables. Uh, and, you know, in one order they had to answer the victim's psychological damage question first. In another they had to estimate the victim's monetary damage first. And in a third order they had to uh, estimate a fine to give to the transgressor first. Let's look at a bit of that data. We're looking at the results for psychological damage dependent variable, and we're looking at the main effect for order of the dependent variables. Uh, so when people were asked to answer the monetary damage uh, questions first, then when they turned to the psychological damage dependent variables, the mean was 3.48, the standard deviation was 1.83, and that's on a 1 to 7 scale. When they were asked to rate psychological damage first, uh, when uh, they rated the psychological damage as 3.78 with a standard deviation of 1.88. And when they were asked to find the transgressor first, they rated psychological damage at 3.26. And so then, uh, below is the results of the statistical test. It was an ANOVA, so the test statistic is an F. And the degrees of freedom are 2 and 132. And that gives us an F statistic of 0 0.98. Uh, the P is greater than 0.38. Eta squared is 0 0.015. So uh, the P value is greater than 0 0.05, that is 0.38 is greater than 0.05. So this was non-significant. I guess you could have guessed that. So that means that we're in this uh, row here shaded in green. I either have correctly rejected a uh, true uh, you know, null hypothesis or I am committing a type 2 error. I'd like to, to know a little bit about that. So what I did was I calculated the power of the statistical test. That is, I went to Cohen and looked that up, and the power was 0.217. Uh, beta, therefore, is 0.783. That is, I have a 78% chance of committing a type 2 error. So most likely, I am committing a type 2 error. Uh, so I want to go back to the drawing board and do this over again. I want my power to be uh, 0.8, 80% or higher. That is an 80% chance uh, of uh, detecting a false null hypothesis. Uh, so when I plug those numbers into Cohen's uh, tables, I get that I will need overall for my experiment 1,200 subjects. I only ran about 120 subjects in the experiment I did last fall. Uh, if I want to have power uh, to be 99% or greater, uh, that is a 99% chance of detecting a false null hypothesis, uh, then 
I would have to have 2,700 subjects in my experiment, but then I'm sure to actually uh, detect a uh, false null hypothesis. And the point I'm making with this is that uh, you could, uh, you know, if you have a large enough n, that is the number of subjects in a study, you can make any trivial uh, difference between the mean significant. And so that's why it's always important to look at the effect size, because since the effect size is dimensionless and you can apply those rubrics, you can know how big a difference your independent variable is making. And that helps you evaluate other things such as uh, the uh, you know, uh, results of the inferential statistics test better. Okay, that's it for statistics. Thank you very much. Oh, we're not over. Uh, one more slide. So what does this mean about your research proposal? Well, in the results section of the final draft, you need to tell me, number one, what statistical tests you have planned, t-tests, ANOVA, uh, correlations, and then you need to present information to conduct a power sample size analysis. And you could estimate, uh, but then you have to explain to me why you couldn't find averages. And I would really prefer you to basically look for the average effect sizes, d's or eta squares, from similar studies. And what I'd like you to do is present that information in uh, a table uh, in your paper. And I've actually uh, created a format for that since tables are so hard to set up in APA style. So that's what I'd like from you for your research proposal that is only the final draft. Okay, so this is really the last slide, so thank you for your